So right, today we are going to see a little bit an overview of um, actuator and sensors. Uh, in the textbook, uh, this topic uh, is mainly devoted to industrial robots, but uh, in the slides I decided to open it a little bit to advanced robotics and to field robotics. So you will see several sensors that are clearly not designed to be used in a, uh, in a structured environment uh, in, a, in, in an industrial setting, let me see. Okay, so let us start. Uh, this is what uh, we are going to see today, a little bit of uh, possible joint actuation systems, some servo motors, uh, and then a, a, a list of sensors, the, the, the pro and cons, and uh, when it's, uh, it is usable or not to use them. Okay, joint actuation system is basically, is basically based by this flow of, let me say, power. We have uh, a uh, source for uh, power. Uh, we will see, depending on the kind of actuators, uh, what is this block. Then a power amplifier and some losses, the motors and some losses, the transmission and some losses. And then in the end, this is the power that goes to our, uh, devoted to the movement of our robot. Now, let us start uh, discussing a little bit about uh, the uh, transmissions. We do need, uh, uh, for the uh, joints, low velocity and large torques. So this is uh, required uh, by uh, most of the applications we are going to use for uh, uh, robots. Now, servo motors uh, are very good uh, in uh, giving us exactly the opposite. The opposite. So, high velocity at low torques. Uh, we can handle this by putting in the middle a gear. It's the same as in your bicycle, okay? A reducer. And now we will uh, see a little bit, a couple of uh, possible transmissions, and we will see what is uh, their contribution to the well, I cannot, I cannot call it uh, uh, dynamics yet, because this is a topic we will start next week. But the contribution to the equilibrium of forces, let me say. Okay. Now, the transmission is usually chosen according to the power kind of rotation, 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 uh, or rotation translation, and the position of the motor with respect to the joint. This is something that is usually done by the manufacturer, you know, the very beginning by uh, the designer of the robot. And this is something that uh, uh, we will not uh, concern our activity as a uh, controller, let me say, guy in a computer science uh, course. But it is important to understand what is the contribution of transmission, and also because sometimes we can experience some weird behavior of the robot due to the transmission. Basically, those are I mean, some kind of transmissions that can be found on the market and mounted on various kind of robots. We can have uh, gears, spur gears. They're used when you need to change the axis of rotation and translating the application point. If you see, you have two different axes of rotation here, okay? And then you need, uh, you need to match to couple the teeth of the, two, of the two gears. Then we can have uh, the screws as this one. In this case, we can convert the rotational motion to a translational motion, okay? Then we can have the belts as this one. Now, the belts uh, can have uh, as a, uh, a drawback that they can be deformed, okay? Because, of course, the, this is made by kind of rubber, and so it can be more easily deformed than a metallic one, of course. 
Finally, we can find chains, and this is the chain of any, any bike, for example. We can experience vibration at large velocity with those one. Okay. Basically, it depends, and uh, we will see also another one that is not listed here as a gear, the one that is, mount that is physically mounted on the robots in our lab, the uh, Kinova, the Kinova robot. Now, what if we don't, don't have uh, a uh, transmission? Well, we experience a robot that is characterized by what we call the direct drive. The advantage of a direct drive is that uh, the elasticity and the backlash are totally eliminated. Now, the elasticity is given by the, uh, the, form, the transmission and by, for example, the belt. Backlash, I will show you a, a draw in a couple of slides just to understand what a backlash is. Basically, if I change the direction of rotation of my gear, I do have a small space without transmission of motion, and this is the backlash. Okay. Small if the gear is a, uh, is a good quality, of course, otherwise it could be a big one. Now, a direct drive exhibit a dynamics no more the couplet. Uh, what does it mean the couplet? We will discover it uh, I mean later on in a couple of uh, minutes and then when we'll make uh, the dynamics. Uh, just to just as a curiosity, the figure here that you see is actually a commercial by a manufacturer of washing machine. It's a commercial for the for the public this this was in a in a uh, website of a journal it's, it's not for uh, technicians okay and they i mean stress their uh, um, their uh, drum with a direct drive in order to show that they eliminated some of the drawbacks of having a transmission that for uh, a washing machine is uh, basically the noise and the vibration, okay? So it is, this is just a curiosity. Those kind of mechanical uh, aspects really affect the efficiency of the motor, and in this case, more than the motor, the transmission of the, mo the movement, okay? Now, this is uh, the gear that uh, we just saw two minutes ago, we have also another kind of gear that is defined as strain wave, which is uh, becoming popular, especially in uh, the so-called lightweight robots. Lightweight robots uh, will be clear later on, but uh, our robot in the lab is a lightweight robot, and uh, I will discuss them uh, later on. This is also commercial, and uh, as I told you very often, commercials are very useful to understand the behavior of uh, the movement of the robot, or in this case, the, the behavior of the gear. And here you can appreciate uh, how the movement uh, is uh, propagated. Okay, there is a, a, a voice that I just muted because I just want to see the movement. Okay, here I have some... Okay, this is an ellipsoid, okay? It's not uh, circular. Here I have the teeth on the external circle. and it on the internal circle here. In this case, uh, we'll, we will have uh, the same axis of rotation. Okay. 
Okay. Now you can appreciate that the internal and the external piece, pieces are rotating at a different velocity. And this is actually what the transmission is made for, okay? To make a transformation of velocity and the inverse one for the torques. And we will see the equation uh, later on. But this is just to have uh, a visual uh, clue of uh, this kind of gear, okay? And then from the, let me say, uh, design aspect, those are coaxial, and this is quite uh, important for, I mean, the, the some kind of robots. Also, they do not experience backlash, and this is backlash. If uh, I need to invert the rotation of the motor, I experience a very small, uh, a very small, uh, let me say, angle in which I lose contact and thus I do not transmit the movement and this is uh, the backlash. And here, for example, a harmonic drive, uh, 0 to 1 degree is a possible order of magnitude for a commercial backlash. Okay, now what do I need uh, when I, I need to, to, to buy, let me say, uh, motors for industrial robots well i would like uh, the motor to be small small and compact and have uh, a large power weight ratio of course i mean i want small compact but powerful because it needs to be mounted uh, on the serial chain and of course the motor here should be as small as possible with respect to the torques that it, it should be able to provide okay so this is a, a a clear requirements for robotics then uh, the robot can uh, work uh, in different uh, situations in some cases uh, i can experience uh, the so-called impulsive torque if i need to make uh, a very fast movement in this let me say a impulsive or or, or step response even if uh, uh, we, we we saw that we always make some kind of uh, of a smoothing of trajectory, uh, I need a motor that is able to provide uh, an impulsive torque and uh, able to work uh, in overload. Providing like, large accelerations, similar to the impulsive torque, but I mean, uh, the velocity can be really, can, can, can be really uh, different, the, the range in which the velocity may vary is really different. If uh, I'm uh, if uh, I'm uh, building a, a transporting belt, I know that this motor will work at a constant velocity for all its life because it just needs to move some object at the same velocity. Okay, it should be able to to be um, uh, to to adapt with respect to different weight of object, but the, I mean, the target velocity is always the same. For robots, I may need to make very fast movement from one place to another of the workspace, and then I may need to be very slow in making some work close to the, the, the application point. And obviously, the motor is the same. I need... Uh, I have positioning accuracy and not only controlling, for example, the velocity, of course, but also the, the position. And then I need to have, uh, I need to take care at low speed. I know that you come from computer science. We are not going to the details uh, of uh, too much details of the motors, but I want to, to provide a technical overview of the different kind of motors. So uh, I know that you don't know what a ripple is, it's okay. I mean, my model should be able to, to work also at low speed, okay? Then I also want to, to be able to implement both trajectory following and position regulation. The normal choice, the, the natural choice, given all these requirements, is to use servo motors. Now, I 
basically have uh, three big families of servo motors depending on the kind of uh, power I, I can have uh, pneumatic motors hydraulic or electrical most of them are electrical but not all of them for some reasons you also may have other one uh, electrical motors uh, is basically you know the energy comes from the no, distribution network from the plug in the wall so it's very let me say easy to find the the the, 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 the energy in an industrial setting for the hydraulic motors, uh, we have uh, the energy that is in hydraulic energy, of course, it is stored in tanks. Okay, we, I do need to have uh, some fluid somewhere. And then I need to convert into mechanical energy. They do have some advantages, we will see later. Pneumatic motors uh, are given by, um, uh, are al alimented by a compressor, okay? And then I need the piston or air turbines here. Just uh, as uh, a curiosity, let us see a pneumatic motor manufactured by a German company. And just to, to show you a little bit uh, the functioning of this motor. It, show, it shows a little bit how it works. Then you have some uh, okay, phase of motion terminal. And here, he, here you see the tubes with the compressed fluid going into the robot. And here you can appreciate a little bit how it works okay you you inflate in the two chambers the air at different pressure and this gives the motion to the robot one of the advantage is that you can change the so-called rigidity that we will see later on when we are going to discuss about uh, dynamics okay so by inflating the air in the, in, the, in the chambers, you can have the, the rotations. You can impose the rotation in the two uh, direction. And then here is, it is just showing the interface and this is a, a commercial. Okay, now pneumatic are not really good uh, for trajectory following due to the dynamics of the fluid, because it is too slow. If we want to, to, to follow a fast trajectory, we need to have a motor that is faster than a trajectory. And if we have in the middle a fluid with its own dynamics, it is slow, it's not good. I can have uh, three different kind of electrical servo motors, depending uh, on some uh, uh, different designs. And we will see it very, very, I mean, quickly a little bit the differences because, as I said, you do have uh, an uh, information background and so I know that you didn't study electrical machine in your uh, uh, career. And then we can have uh, two different kinds also of hydraulic servo motors. Here in this uh, plot, kind of dark, but you can uh, appreciate it in the slide, we can see a little bit some of the parts a motor is composed of. Okay, rotor and stator, brush, brake, those are part of the motor. Then we have the encoder. We will see later today what an encoder is. Okay. Okay, what are the advantages of electrical servo motors? Power supply, 
easy to to find in in most of the you know the, the buildings <laughs> then you have a, a, a huge offer in the market it means that you can find a little bit what you you, you are looking for power conversion efficient enough maintenance is okay and then you do not pollute the working environment you have some uh, drawbacks you can have uh, warming uh, burnout so you can have uh, the warming of the motors in case you need to uh, stay in a static situation and holding for example a weight okay due to the gravity here you can experience a, a warming of the motor and maybe it could be appropriate to, to activate the emergency brakes must be used with uh, attention in a flammable environment and some of the, of the industrial environment are flammable and all the components are required to be compliant with that. Now, hydraulic servo motors, okay, they do not suffer from burnout. Basically, you just close the valve and, uh, and the fluid is, uh, is taking into account the compensation. Then the fluid uh, also facilitates the heat disposal. It means that uh, it's self-lubricated. It does not explode. And then uh, the power to weight ratios is very good. It means that, uh, I mean, they, the, the, the density of the power is larger than the electrical motors. However, it's not so easy to, to have, you know, an hydraulic power station. You need it uh, at the pressure required by the motor. The demand, the offer, sorry, is, uh, is limited. And so you don't find, uh, good, good morning, uh, Paolo Curu. You don't find uh, a lot of models in the model, in the market, sorry, and uh, when it is the case, the price, you know, is not lowered by a huge market. Power conversion is not efficient as for electrical motors. You need maintenance and you may experience leakage during the work. Okay, from a control point of view, I like electrical servo motors because they do have a very good dynamic response. I can uh, play with them and implement diff different kind of controllers depending on the need. I may need the transmissions and from the dynamic, by, uh, dynamic uh, behavior, it means uh, the presence of elasticity and backlash, which are, of course, uh, not very nice. The hydraulic servo motors change their behavior depending on the temperature. This is not very nice because if uh, I do remember uh, control theory. The first step is to have the model of the process. And uh, typically, we, we define it as a PS. You know, a P is the process, and S is the, is the Laplace variable. It means uh, the transfer function of the process, in case it is linear, of course. And this is the starting point for my controller. Now, imagine that you make your design you, of uh, the controller, then I change the process uh, without, uh, without uh, notice. Obviously, your design is not valid anymore. So 
that the, the fact that uh, it changes the, the behavior depending on temperature is not very nice. Then it is good because it can provide easily large torques at low velocity. Okay, those are, this is really a, an overview, a technical overview of uh, the actuators, just in order to... to, to, to then, uh, okay, let me skip a little bit uh, the power amplifiers, because, of course, uh, I have uh, a control signal that comes out from uh, my controller, with a low power, of course, and also low voltage, and then I need to regulate the power flow to the actuators that comes from the energy source. And here we really go into some uh, details of uh, uh, electrical machine that in this, in this moment we can skip, okay? And also the power, the details on the power supply. Now, I want just to, 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 to show you without entering into the details, but the, just to show you the block uh, scheme of uh, an electric drive, uh, including the amplifier. The reason why I want to show it is that, uh, well, what you have done uh, in uh, uh, control theory actually is true, is real, in the sense that uh, this is what it is. Uh, it is used, for example, to uh, control at a lower level a uh, drive amplifier. If you see, I write an electrical balance uh, that, okay, here there is the Laplace variable, but it's linear, otherwise mechanical balance is linear, the power amplifier under center, certain uh, assumption is linear, and, and thus the, my block scheme is mostly linear. Can you spot, uh, I don't know if is it readable or not, but can you spot the sole block here that is not linear? Here I have an integrator, here I have an integrator and inertia, friction, friction, gain, integrator for the, for the electrical balance, resistance, uh, okay, this is another, it's part of the dynamics, this is the power amplifier, this is a generic uh, uh, CS, the controller, and what is this one? Can you see it from there? Huh? Uh, it, that's a saturation. So this is the only nonlinear block. So you may have uh, designed this controller with the uh, skills acquired after uh, your class of uh, control theory, except for the presence of the saturation, because you, you didn't study nonlinear um, uh, blocks. Okay. Now, just again to, to, to show you a little bit the, 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 the in practice. In practice, we can have a velocity controller generator uh, after some, some assumption related to the, basically here to the friction and to some uh, model parameters. You, you can consider your motor as a machine for which you can assign the angular velocity by modulating the voltage uh, in input of your motors. So when you buy motors and you design from scratch your robot, if you consider a velocity controller generator, you don't need to go into the details of the control loop of the motor. You can assume that you control the angular velocity. On the other hand, Okay, here you can put the current protection. This is really low. on the other end. You can also be in, in presence of a torque controller generator, in which your uh, your uh, uh, voltage is let me say proportional to the torque of the motor. Okay, here there is another term, but let me say proportional to the torque. Of the, motor. Uh, the 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 low level controller for you can be a block 
that you you can more or less ignore in this course because you can assume that you are able to assign desired velocity or desired torque. Actually, desired velocity is what we have just seen in kinematic control algorithms. That's exactly what we are doing. Q dot can be given to the motor, and that's and we forget it because we we need to focus on some other concept uh, related to robotics, okay? And then we will design some controller where we do need to, to assign uh, the torque for each motor. Okay, this is an hydraulic drive, and uh, just as a curiosity, is not so far from uh, the, the, the previous one. This is the, the property, let me say, of uh, generalization control theory, I can, uh, abstract the model and then apply the same theory okay now let us see from the mathematical aspect and i think this is the only equation of today the effect of the transmission now the effect of the transmission is really the same as you experience when you go on your bike okay exactly the same now here i have uh, with the subscript m the motor so my motor has a, a torque provided by the motor, a certain inertia, a certain friction. Graphically, the friction here is represented by the visually the fact that those two surfaces are are, are uh, uh, in contact. But this is uh, the friction. Then uh, my motor has a, a certain angular position. Those two discs here represent uh, the transmission without the teeth. Okay, graphically, this is the transmission. And then I have uh, the so called link position, theta. And the link has uh, a certain inertia, a certain center of mass, and this is mass by gravity. And L is the distance of the, of the center of mass uh, with respect to the axis of rotation. Okay, so this is our uh, model. And we want to understand now what is the effect of the transmission here. Typically, the transmission has an order of magnitude of 100, let me say, and the fast part is the motor. Okay? So we, we, we do have that the relationship between the two angular velocity is that the angular velocity of the motor is kr times the angular velocity of the link. This is exactly when you go on a bike up a hill and the angular velocity of uh, your movement is much faster than the angular velocity of the wheels. Okay, KR is larger, larger than one. The same ratio applies uh, to the position. And uh, if I'm using a gear reduction, also to the radius of the disk, but inverted. Okay. Now, let us apply a mechanical equilibrium, the second law of dynamics. On the motor, I do have uh, a force equal mass by acceleration, but for the rotational motion, force is the torque, is equal. Uh, mass by acceleration is inertia by angular acceleration. Then, uh, I have to include the, the non-conservative forces. The friction is the first one. And this is the, the, the force exchanged with the, by mean of the transmission with the link, okay, coming from the link. Because, and this is simply force multiplied by radius. Okay, because they exchange the, the same force in the contact point and then they have two different radius. This is the... the what do I have on the link side? Well, on the link side, I have uh, 
force coming from the transmission. Depth is the same, but of course the radius of the disk is different. Inertia by angular acceleration, friction, and then I may have a torque given by a load. So for example, this is a load, of course a linear force, but it's given a, a, a torque to this motor, if we are talking about this motor, okay? And this is a CL here, load. Okay, now I do uh, eliminate F from the two equations, basically, and uh, I simply put on the left-hand side, well, I, I, I leave on the left-hand side uh, the torque of the motor. I collect, because omega, I may write it as uh, um, uh, the, the velocity of the motor divided by k, and the same for the angular acceleration. And so my equation is all written with respect to the motor acceleration and velocity. And uh, something very, very interesting can be observed. My motor feels its own inertia, of course, then it feels the inertia of the link divided by the square of k. If k is 100, it means that this is uh, uh, 10,000 times smaller than the physical one. And this is the advantage of having the transmission. When, we, when you are on a bike and you are uh, going uphill, this is the way, it's not really with inertia, but it's rather with the load, the, the, the benefit of using the, the, the gear. With the friction, uh, we have the same uh, consideration. With the load, uh, only divided by Kr. So 100. For example, if the load is only the gravity, well, my gravity is 100 less than the physical one. Okay. Okay. We end here with the actuators. The take home message is that uh, in this course, Actuators for us would be tools. We need to know more or less how they work, but we don't need to go into uh, extreme details of the way they work. We will be able to assign to a motor either the desired velocity or the desired torque, and we will assume that the motor will be more or less perfect. So it, provides us the desired velocity at each joint or the desired torque at each joint, okay? But this is a generic overview of a kind of actuators that you can find in industrial setting. Now, next topic is the sensor, and uh, I consider appropriate uh, to have uh, a small break, even if it's a little bit earlier than usual, uh, a small break uh, before uh, uh, changing the topic.